Last thing I share is this. The deal is this. If you want to draw a crowd right now, all you have to do is draw a line. That's it. And we have enough pundits for doing it, but we need prophets who are doing it a different way. Pundits are not going to heal a nation. Prophets will. That's why they say, I say this to you guys. So the deal is this. You draw the line and you polarize, right? Either on the one side, the radical left, or one side, the radical right. Those folks think they're radicals. You know why they think they're radicals? Because they have all these people polarized to them. But they're not radical. They're not radical because they only take shots from one direction. The other side. And they're totally insulated in their bubble, right? With all these people who like them or retweet them or whatever. They're not radical. Really, the radical place is the radical gap. The people in the radical gap are these folks who actually love the folks on either side. They might not agree with their ideology, but they find some things from this side that they can agree with that lines up with the kingdom of heaven. They find some things from this other side that line up with the kingdom of heaven. And they're holding on while these two other two are trying to tear the fabric of our nation apart. These other folks in this radical gap, I call it the radical gap because you're going to take shots from both sides. And these people in the radical gap are dealing with the tension and the vulnerability of being in that place. These other folks on the other side are not dealing with tension and vulnerability. All they do is just label and talk about the other side. They don't deal with tension. They don't deal with nuance. They don't deal with complexity. But the folks in the radical gap do. And so but here's the beautiful thing. If you stay in that place long enough, God's going to use you to heal the nation. Navigating through both of those tensions all at the same time. So... And Good time. Mine went off before yours, right? <laughs> uh, so, so the deal is this. That's, that's the place. God is, Ezekiel twenty two thirty. he's not looking for somebody to stand on the radical left or the radical right. He's looking for somebody to stand in the radical gap. Yeah. So, so Sometimes that radical gap is you being released in the midst of both sides. Who knows? But we're going to be the ones that we use to heal the nation. Stand to you if you pray into this for you. Yeah. Interesting thing about that house that my friend had where the Civil War ended in his family's front yard, it was actually in between both the North and the South. The only thing that stood between those arms was that house. It's, st it's still around to this day. You can walk up to it. There's still bullet holes in it from the Civil War. Interesting thing, that house became a hospital for both sides just two days after the Civil War was over. And former black slaves worked with white nurses to heal the wounds of brothers who had been fighting against each other for way too long. That house sounds like us. We're called to be that house that's going to stand in the gap. We may take some shots from both sides, but it's worth it to stand in the gap with Jesus. So I'm hoping this thing being healed. You know why? Because God had not forgot about the prayers of your mama and your papa. And although the people who founded this nation, he hadn't forgotten about all those prayers. And we're not in this place of starting over. God's not, he wasn't surprised by the coronavirus. He's not surprised by the tension that we're in right now. He's just looking for a new generation of people to realize our battle is not against flesh and blood, but it's against principalities and powers, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places. Because the deal is this, Jesus dealt with racism too. But he handled it way different, different than people are handling right now, especially in the secular community. Some of us in the church, you look at our Facebook and Twitter accounts, we're handling the same way the world is. <laughs> But God's going to deal with that right now. So here's the thing. Jesus wants to go through a Samaritan village. In Luke 9, uh, verse 51, he sends two disciples, hey, go prepare the way for me. Go through this Samaritan village, and I want you to prepare uh, for them. Prepare them for me coming through the area. Well, here's the thing. Jews and Samaritans hated each other back then. There was a racial conflict back then. Jesus cutting through that Samaritan village would be like me back in the day, living in Fort Worth, Texas, one that cut through the neighborhood called the Stockyards in Fort Worth, Texas at the wrong time of night. Or them wanting to come through our neighborhood at the wrong time of the middle of the night. Back in the day, that was just one of those things that went on. If you live in New York, there's certain neighborhoods you couldn't cut through if you were uh, Irish or Italian or whatever. Y'all get where I'm coming from? Right? Later on, it went on to colors like Crips and Bloods. <laughs> but Jesus can't cut through that neighborhood because he's Jewish. And that's okay. So, the people say no, and so the disciples, they get angry. What do they say? Lord, do you want us to call down fire from heaven because of this racism that you experienced? 
You want us to call down a Molotov cocktail from heaven and just nuke this place? Jesus says something so profound in that moment. He says this. The son of man didn't come to destroy man's lives, but to save them. Right? This is powerful. But before he said that, he said this. You don't know what spirit you're speaking from. In other words, you think you want justice, but really you want revenge. You don't know what spirit you're speaking from. An anger man never achieves the righteousness of God. That's so good. Of course, there's a lot of places we can jump off there. But here's the thing. Jesus didn't stop there. You know, he continues to address what happened in Samaria. And he continues to address what happened with the racism there. Here's what happens. Luke 10. He gives 72 people authority to preach the gospel. And they come back to Jesus and they say, listen, Lord, even the demons are subject to us in your name. Jesus says, I saw Satan fall like lightning. Now, here's the thing. I don't think he was talking about at the beginning of the age. I think he's talking about what happened over that region. I believe a principality over that region was dislodged from the hearts of the people that were in agreement with it. In other words, because it took a, t- a towel to the earth and cleansed men's souls with the preaching of the gospel, something broke open in the heavens. And in that place of an open heaven, guess what happens? A Jewish lawyer who hated the Samaritans, and we know he hates the Samaritans so much so that he wouldn't even say uh, the, that the Samaritan was a good person in the good Samaritan story. If you say Samaritan, he says, who's my neighbor? And Jesus says, oh, let me tell you the story about a good Samaritan. Hold up, a good Samaritan? Jesus, why would you be telling a story about a good Samaritan? You just experienced racism from the Samaritans. Why would you be telling a story about a good Samaritan? Jesus is doing this. He's saying this. While the heavens are opened up, I'm going to use this opportunity to destigmatize the very people you can't stand. And I'm going to tell you the story about a good police officer. I'm going to tell you the story about a good Jewish man. I'm going to tell you a story about a good white man or a good black man. I'll tell you a story about a, a good Samaritan. In other words, while the heavens are opened up, I'm going to use this opportunity to, to be breakthrough in this area and destigmatize the very people that you can't stand. And I'm going to shift the narrative. Church, that's where we are right now. We have to shift the narrative. We have to take control over this thing by releasing the towel on the earth and the sword in the heavens and changing the narrative. Now, am I saying that we ignore some of the things we're seeing? No, we don't ignore it. But in the midst of it, we get in the middle of everything that's going on and we contend for this thing to turn. That makes sense? So so that's what I'm saying because, again, a battle is not against flesh and blood. So my playbook for operating in this right now is really more on -on one-on-one relational uh, 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 connection. And that is this. uh, 2 Timothy chapter 2, verses 24 to 26 says this. But the Lord's bond servant must not be quarrelsome. But must be gentle, kind to all. As Bishop said, all means all in Greek and English. Kind to all, able to instruct so that those in opposition may repent and come to their senses and escape the snare of Satan who's taken the captive to do his will. So this scripture came alive to me years ago when I actually experienced racism from a family in my neighborhood a few years back, several years back. And uh, while I'm there in this neighborhood, uh, there was this man who was visiting from another country, and he said some things that were pretty ugly to my wife. So, being the kind of guy that I am, I thought, well, maybe I need to go have a conversation with him. Honestly, it's probably more like that song that's out right now. Uh, try Jesus, but don't try me. <laughs> it probably was more like that. So, I show up at that house, and uh, I can see that one. the gentleman wasn't home. But his son-in-law came to my house later on and apologized profusely. He said, hey, he's, he's old school. He's from this certain mindset. I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. He has biases. I said, I understand. I understand. And I forgave. And then later on, that, the, man's, that, that, the young man's father-in-law, you ever have people apologize without apologizing? Yes. They're like, oh, my God, your shoelaces are amazing. <laughs> you know, can I get that car door for you? Can I get that window for you? He was like in that boat. The Lord said, just take that. He's trying to apologize. But his daughter, for whatever reason, when I would walk by her, she just acted like I didn't exist. Like she would just go. And I just kind of thought, you know what? Talk to the hand. I don't see you either. Right. I did that too. 
Well, all that changed when one day her two taller girls wanted to play on the playground with my two taller boys. It was just the six of us out there. Her uh, father was out there with them. And when I walked onto the playground, the oldest of those little girls, she had to be about six or seven years old at the time. She looked at me and began to scream, I'm ready to leave right now. I thought, wow, that's kind of intense. <laughs> and then she started crying, I'm ready to leave now. She's kicking and screaming and crying at the same time. Her grandfather says, sweetheart, we just, we just got out here. Why are you ready to leave? And she runs to him. And then when she runs to him, she turns around. She looks at me, her eyes rolling back of her head. She falls on the ground and she begins to go around like this. Okay, so I'm kind of analytical, right? And uh, <laughs> so I went through these series of thoughts. My second thought was this man, I wonder if she's having like an epileptic fit or something. Uh, I wonder if this is like a, a sunstroke or something. But the first thought I had was this that's a demon. <laughs> it's, the, it's the demon of division and racism in this family. And it's affecting the next generation. Whoa. Use the authority that I've given you. Come on. It's good. Yeah. But I went to the other thoughts. Right? <laughs> and then about the time that I went to her grandfather, I was trying to, try to say, uh, has she ever had an epileptic fit before? The first thing that came out of my mouth is this. In the name of Jesus, stop and come out. And she went totally limp. And for some reason, I don't know why, maybe... Y'all can help me understand this. <laughs> this but the, the grandfather could not pick that little girl up. Oh. So uh, I, I pick her up. I throw on my shoulder. And honestly, I'm like praying in the Holy Ghost the whole time. I'm like, huck a shuck a luck, huck a shuck a luck. I'm like, devil, you're not going to bite my back. <laughs> There's not going to be like exorcist too. You're not going to spit green pea juice on me. And I plead the blood, the blood, the blood, the blood. Huck a shuck a luck, huck a shuck a luck. I get the little girl home and her mother opens the door. She says, what did you do to my daughter? I said, hold up. Your father's right behind me. Let me just lay her on the couch. I lay her on the couch. She comes too. They took her to the doctor later on. They told me they could find nothing wrong with her. She was totally, this was a spiritual issue. But in that moment, y'all, I go home and I'm grieved. But my spirit is grieved with me. Right? The Holy Spirit agreed with me. So I get along and say, God, what's, what's going on? And the Lord said, to the, said this to me. He said, William, every time you walk past that mother and you play the devil's game and you chose not to overcome evil with good by just saying hi, you are empowering the very demon that's affecting that family and it's destroying the next generation. You're not the Republicans bond serving. You're not the Democrats, my servant. You're my bond servant. And you don't have the right to respond to this thing the way the world does if you want to see people get set free. Because a Lord bond servant cannot be quashed on Facebook. Twitter, social media. Because we belong to him. Left wing, right wing, the whole bird is sick. Who's going to bring the dove back in America? 